Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here GMAT Review, the official guide, the 13th edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The book contains 230 problem solving questions. It contains 174 data sufficiency questions. We have already solved every single math problem from this book. If you are interested in watching any of the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Right now, we are in the process of redoing the problems and we are on page number 290. Please turn to it. Page number 290, the very first problem that you see there in the second column. Problem number 161. Let's see what it has to say. Problem number 161. Problem 161 tells us that the inflation index for the year 1989 relative to 1970 was 3. Point, was 3.56. Now whenever they say that the inflation index in a certain year was such and such amount relative to some other year, the relative to 1970 that they talk about is our base here now. So what we're dealing with here is some kind of a price index an inflation index or price index if you like and our base here our base here is going to be 1970 why 1970 because they tell us relative to 1970 and therefore whichever the base here is typically we use the index for that year the index for 1970 is going to be 100 even that's our index for 1970 because our data is our point of reference they go on to tell us that the index in 1989, index in 1989 was, let's call it I subscript 89, was 356. 356. What that tells us is that, what that tells us is that anything that cost a dollar in 1970, if there was something that cost a dollar in 1970, the same exact object is going to cost in 1989 three dollars and fifty six cents. Do you understand? Assuming that it follows the same pattern, same price index pattern, uh, the inflation, uh, inflation trend that is, which is what the problem tells us. The question is very simple. We are buying a mixture and we are told that the price of the mixture, price of the mixture in 1970 is how much? We are not told that rather because we are being asked that. The question simply is, what's the price of a certain mixture? In 19, uh, uh, what was the price that prevailed in 1970 for a, for a certain mixture? Let's see what they tell us. In the first statement, they tell us that the price of this mixture was the price of this mixture was the price was one hundred and two dollars and forty cents more in 1989 compared to 1970 compared to 1970. This part was not necessary because of course it's compared to 1970 because that's the whole bloody point here. 1970 is our base here. The question is, is this enough information enough? Is this information that, that is being provided to us in statement number one, is that sufficient data? Do we have sufficient data in, in, a, in a statement one to be able to answer the question? The question being, what was the price in 1970 for this mixture? Let's find out, shall we? The price, in, price was $102.40 more in 1989. So the price in 1989 was whatever the price that prevailed in 1970 plus $102.40 more. That's what this tells us. But we know what the price of 19... Well, you, we know what the price in 1989 was. The price in 1989 of this mixture was 3.56 times this was 3.56 times the price that prevailed in 1970. We know that. It's right there. The index was three. Index was 356. As we said in the beginning, three index of 356 simply means that if something that costs a dollar, the same exact thing is going to cost three dollars and fifty-six cents. So we know that the price in 1989 is simply 3.56 times the price that uh, that, that prevailed in 1970. That's it. We are done. We have a one very simple, very simple linear equation. Of course, we can figure out the value of the uh, price of price of the price of the mixture in 1970. The first statement does the job. The first statement does the job quite nicely. A D B C E A D B C E. Now that we established that the first statement by itself is enough, 
We know now that the answer cannot be B, C, or E. Answer would have to be either A or D. Now, as far as the exam is concerned, we are done. As of this point, we are done. We can actually finish it up just for learning purposes. So let's do that. Let's finish it up. Okay, the price in 1989 is this amount. I'm going to write this uh, together so that it's easier to see. It is 3.56 times the price that prevailed in 1970. Let's call the price that prevailed in 1970 the price of the mixture in 1970. Let's represent with X. Okay, so this is easier. This is very cumbersome. Let's replace this thing with letter X so that it's, it's easy to deal with. Now, now it is more comfortable for us to deal with because we are used to seeing this thing. So as you can see, it's a very simple linear equation. Subtract x from both sides and we find that 2.56x equals 102.4. Divide both sides by 2, divide both sides by 2.56 and we end up with 102.4 over 2.56. Multiply the top and the bottom by 100. Multiply top and bottom by 100 so that we can get to the decimal point. And once we do that, we end up with 1,000 or 10,240 over 256. 1,240 or 10,240 over 256. Let's write that amount. Let's write this thing as 1,024 times 10 over 256. Again, keep in mind that we don't have to do any of this thing in the real exam. Do you understand? We don't have to do anything in the real exam at all. All I'm trying to make you understand, all I'm trying to make you see is that these numbers, even though they may look very awkward, 256 and 1024, I assure you that nothing in this exam appears by fluke. Nothing that appears uh, willy-nilly. Everything, all the problems obviously are designed very carefully. All the numbers that you see there that are put in front of you are there for a reason. You recognize this number 1024. We're going to digress here for a second. We're going to digress big time for a second, okay? This is this is not prerequisite. You're not required. You're not uh, nobody. Uh, nobody assumes that you would have this knowledge in order for you to sit for the GMAT. This is just a side note. If you know it, fine. If you don't know it, it's not a big deal. Don't sweat. Do you understand? You recognize this 1024. When we talk about, in the computer language, when we talk about one kilobyte, in the computer language, when we talk about one kilobyte, one kilobyte is not equal, it does not equal 1,000 bytes. It does not equal 1,000 bytes. One kilobyte, kilo, even though it means 1,000, we have to remember, we must keep in mind in, that in the world of the computers, in the world of the computer language, computer programming, Everything is black and white. Everything is black and white. Everything is right or wrong. Everything is yes or no. It's a binary world we live in. It's a binary world we live in. One kilobyte simply means it is 2 raised to 10. It is 2 raised to 10. And if you don't believe me, do it out very quickly. It doesn't take that long. 2 raised to 1 is 2. Then we have 4. Then we have 8, uh, 16, 32, 64, 128. And we are up to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And 8 would be 256. 256 is 256 is 2 raised to 8. 2 raised to 8 is 256. And you multiply that again by 2, 256, you multiply again by 2, you will end up with 250 times 2 is 500, so it's going to end up with 512. Of course, you're going to end up with 512 because that's exactly half of this amount. Half of 1024 is 512. When you take that 512, which is 2 raised to 9, you multiply that one more time and you'll end up with 1024. That's 2 raised to 10. This amount is 2 raised to 10. Or can we squeeze that in there? Let's put it right in here, replace it with 2 raised to 10. It's because we don't have the room. 2 raised to 10. And 256, we just saw it here, is 2 raised to 8. 256, we just saw, is 2 raised to 8. So we can replace that here. We have 2 raised to 8 at the bottom. We have 2 raised to 10 at the, at the, at the top. We can divide top and bottom by 2 raised to 8, and we end up with 2 squared. 2 squared, 2 squared times 10 is 40. It turns out that the price that prevailed in 1970 for this particular mixture was exactly $40. But none of this was necessary, you understand? We were doing it just for the hell of it. Let's go on to the second statement, shall we? The first statement, as we found out, was quite sufficient. Let's look at the second statement. Just give me one quick break. 
second statement. Remember, the price we found was $40 from the first statement. Let's see what they tell us in the second statement. Let's see if the second statement is any good. In the second statement, they go on to tell us that the price in 1989 was exactly $142.40. $142.40. But we know that the price in 1989 was simply 3.56 3 times the price in 1970, which we are told happens to be 142.40. Again, it's a very simple, very straightforward linear equation. Of course, we can solve for the unknown. Of course, we can solve for the price of 1970, price in 1970. Just divide both sides of the equation by 3.56. That's it. Second statement does the job also quite nicely. We had first we had found out earlier A D B C E. We had found out earlier that the first statement was sufficient and therefore we knew that the answer could not be B, C or E in this problem. And we just found out that the second statement does the job quite nicely as well. Therefore the answer is D. That's it. Again, for the next few minutes for the for the for the next few seconds, we're gonna actually finish it up just for the hell of it, but not in the real exam. Do you understand? It's very simple as we said. The price in 1970 is simply going to be this amount, 142.40 over 3.56, multiply top and bottom by 100 one more time, and we end up with we end up with 142, 142. Well, we can just replace the decimal here. That's it. We end up with 14,240 14, divided by 356, which can which in turn can be written as 1424 times 10 over 356. This is where the trick comes into it. You have to be calm, you have to be collected, you cannot be nervous during the exam. These numbers, as I always, as, as, as I'm reminding you one more time, no matter how awkward the numbers look to you, they are there for by design. The price of this particular item or any particular item, any item for that matter, does, does not come out to be $39.87. It just does not in this exam. Is, is, is the numbers are there for design. Look at, look at it calmly. If you double 350, double of 350 is 700, and if you double 700, we get 1400. In other words, in other words, 350 times 4 is 1400, and 6 times 4 is 24, and 6 times 4 is 24. If we add the two numbers, we end up with 1424. 1424 is exactly what we have, 1424. So 350 times 4 is 1400, and 6 times 4 is 24, therefore 356, 356 is 350 plus 6, 356 times 4 will be exactly 1424. If we divide top and bottom by 356, we get a 4, 4 times 10 is 40, just like before. No surprise here, just like before. The two statements never contradict each other. Whatever you find in the first statement, if you found out that the price was $40 from the first statement, you better find the same price based on your work in the second statement. And if you do not find the same price, then something has gone wrong. Something has gone wrong either in your work in the first statement that you did, or the work that you just did in the second statement, or perhaps the work that you did in both of the statements were wrong. Who knows? But they cannot be both right. Do you understand? Let's move on to the next problem. Problem number 162. Problem number 162. Problem 162 tells us, or rather, it, it, it is ask us, is 5 raised to k less than 1000? That's all. Very simple, very straightforward question. Let's see what they tell us. In the first statement, they tell us that 5 raised to k plus 1 is more than 3,000. We know that 5 raised to k plus 1 is more than 3,000. Well, 5 raised to k plus 1 can be written as 5 times uh, 5 times 5 raised to k because 5 raised to 1 plus 5 raised to k 5 raised to 1 plus 5 raised to k is simply 5 raised to k plus 1. And the question is, is this amount more than 3,000 which in turn can be written as 5 times 600. Now since 5 is a positive number, 
We can divide both sides of this inequality by 5 without having to worry about reversing the direction of the inequality because we're not dividing by we're not dividing or multiplying by a negative number. When we multiply or divide uh, an, an inequality by a negative number, that's when we have to remember to switch the direction of the inequality. We don't have to worry about that complication here. Let's divide both sides by 5. And now we end up with 5 raised to k. We know it's more than 600. We are told that. First statement tells us that. What can we get from that? What can we gather from that? What can we extract from that? Well, what we can extract from that is the fact that we know that 5 raised to 3, we know that 5 raised to 3 is 125. That we do know. Because 5 times 5 is 25, and 25 times 5 is 125. And 5 raised to 4, 5 raised to 4 we know that 125 times 4 is 625. It's 625. Keep listening. So if we had been told, if we had been told that 5 raised to k is more than 625, if we had been told that 5 raised to k is six, more than 625, and we know that 625 is 5 raised to 4, that would have implied, this would have implied that k is more than 4. But that is not the case. All we know is that 5 raised to k is more than 600. It's not 625. It's more than 600. So we cannot say for sure that k is more than 4, but we do know for a fact that it has to be more than 3 because 5 raised to 3 is simply 125, and we have 600. So k, whatever it is, is more than 3. k, whatever it is, is more than 3. That's what we get out of it. k is more than 3. The question is, is that that's what they tell us. The first statement tells us that k is more than 3. That's what they're telling us here. And they tell us that 5 raised to k plus 1 is more than 3,000. And when we analyze it and when we simplify that, uh, that statement, that's what that boils down to. Now we know for a fact that k, whatever the hell it is, is more than 3. The question is, is that sufficient data? Is that sufficient data for us to be able to ascertain whether or not 5 raised to k is less than 1,000? Let's find out, shall we? Let's find out. Well, there are two possibilities. We know that we know that k is more than 3. That we do know. k is more than 3. That we do know. We established that here. There are two possibilities. Make up two very simple scenarios. Don't make it complicated. Make it very simple. Let's pretend that k is equal to 4. Make, let's pretend k is equal to 4. If that, in that case, 5 raised to 4, we just found out, was 125 times 5, which is 625. The question is, is 5 raised to k, is 5 raised to k less than 1,000? Well, if k happens to be 4, if k happens to be 4, which is 625, which is less than 1,000? Which is less than 1,000? So the answer to our answer to the question that is being asked is 5 raised to k less than 1000. In this case, the answer would be yes, it is. Yes, 5 raised to k, 5 raised to k is less than 1000 because it's 625. Because we know the k is more than 3, therefore we pretend the k is equal to 4. But what if k happens to be, what if k happens to be, instead of 4, what if k happens to be 40? Or 40 million for that matter? Well, in that case, 5 raised to 40 is 5 raised to 40, is 5 raised to 40 less than 1,000? Is 5 raised to 40 less than 1,000? To which the answer, of course, is hell no. It is not less than 1,000. Here the answer was yes. Here the answer is no. Simply knowing that it is more than 3, simply knowing that the exponent is more than 3, does not enable us to answer whether or not that quantity is going to be less than 1,000. It depends on how large the k is. Simply knowing that it's simply more than three, it doesn't matter. We could have, we could have, we could have been, we could have been cuter if you want. If you want to be cuter, we could have been cuter instead of four and forty, which is a simple thing to deal with. We could have pretended that k was three point zero 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 one, in which case five raised to k, in which case five raised to k was going to be just a little bit more than one hundred twenty-five. Some little bit more than one hundred twenty-five is is some amount that's just a little bit more than one hundred twenty-five. Is that amount less than one thousand? The answer, of course, is yes. On the other hand, instead of, instead of some amount being 3.14, it could have been 3 million. If k happens to be 3 million, instead of 40, we could have put in 3 million for, for, for k. You get the idea. The first statement does not do the job. The first statement does not do the job. A, D, B, C, E. A, D, B, C, E. Now that we established that the first statement by itself is no good, we know now that the answer cannot be A or D. answer would have to be either B, C or E. Let's look at second statement. Let's look at second statement. What do 
they have to tell us in the second statement? In the second statement they go on to tell us that 5 raised to k minus 1 5 raised to k minus 1 is equal to is equal to 5k minus 500 interesting 5k minus 500 let's see what we can do with it again we're going to have to do some manipulation we're going to have to do some some juggling so here's so this implies that 5 raised to k minus this amount 5 raised to k minus 1 has to equal 500 because when you bring the negative 500 when you bring the negative 500 to the other side when you bring this negative 500 to the other side it becomes positive and when we bring this uh, this amount to the other side or if it makes it simpler for you I can write it we don't have to be such a baby do we you get the idea first we bring the 500 here and then we bring that thing here and then we switch the two directions because we want the k on this side anyway so where do we go from here we have 5 raised to k here, we have 5 raised to k minus a here. Do you find any common factor? The common factor here would be 5 raised to k minus 1. If you take out the 5 raised to k minus 1 here, because this thing, 5 raised to k, can be written as... No, I, I, it's not necessary. I'm not going I'm not going to baby you. Let's take it out common. And if you take out 5 raised to k minus 1 here, you're left with 5. Because 5 times 5 raised to k minus 1 is simply 5 raised to k minus 1 plus 1. And the 1 cancels out, we end up with 5 raised to k. I just told you I'm not going to baby you, I'm just, I, I just did that. So that's just 5. Minus, we took out 5 raised to k minus 1, we took out the entire thing, so it's 1. And that equals 500. Okay, let's see what it takes us. 5 minus 1 is simply 4. 5 minus 1 is simply 4, so it's 4 times 5 raised to k minus 1 is equal to 500. Divide both sides by 4. 4 drops out. Let me switch the marker. This marker is dying. It's not legible anymore. We are almost there. And that tells us that 5 raised to k, that tells us that 5 raised to k minus 1 has to equal 500 divided by 4. 500 divided by 4, if you take half of 500, that's 250, and then if you take a half of 250, it's 125. 125. Which in turn can be written as 5 raised to 3. Which, which in turn can be written as 5 raised to 3. Let's continue this. this let's continue this. Let's, let's, let's continue this bit over here. So this tells us that 5 raised to k minus 1 is equal to 5 raised to 3. Well, if 5 raised to k minus 1 is equal to 5 raised to 3, then k minus 1 must equal 3. This implies that k minus 1 must equal 3, which in turn implies that k equals to 4. Again, I should point out here, listen, I should point out, which I did not do, which, I, which, is, which is my fault, I just realized it, that I made a huge boo-boo. Uh, I should have pointed out to you from very beginning that if you look at it, after we did all this work, I just dawned on me that I never explained to you. If you look at it, you should be able to realize immediately, just by looking at this equation, you should be able to realize that there is no reason why, there is no reason whatsoever, there is no reason whatsoever why we can't solve for k. It's only one unknown, it's one equation, we should be able to solve for it. One, one unknown, one equation, we can very easily find the value of k. And as long as you can find the value of k, it does not matter what k turns out to be, whether the k turns out to be 4, or whether k turns out to be 47, or whether k turns out to be 37.35, it does not matter what k, the value of the k turns out to be. The point here is, the bloody point here is that, it is possible just by looking at this equation to realize that we are able to get the value of k. We are able to get a unique value of k. And as long as we can get the unique value of k, we can answer this question. As long as I know k, I can tell you whether 5 raised to that amount is going to be less than 1,000. That's what it is. The answer to which is going to be either yes or no. It doesn't matter whether the answer turns out to be yes. It doesn't matter whether the answer turns out to be no. The point is, we will be able to give a definitive answer. Once we know the value of k, we are able to give a definitive answer whether this quantity is less than 1,000. Therefore, second statement by itself is also sufficient. Second statement by itself is also sufficient. The answer to this problem is D. As we found here towards the very end, that was a silly thing to do me. Because now we know that k is equal to 4. Now we know 
k is equal to 4, but that all of this thing will be not something we'll do in the real exam. Never, 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 ever, never. It was not necessary. k is equal to 4. If k is equal to 4, can you tell me this question whether 5 raised to 4 is less than 1000? Of course you can answer that question. It's going to be either yes or no, but there is a definitive answer here. Therefore the answer is D. Second statement by itself also enables us to be able to answer the question. Okay. It doesn't matter if the answer to the question that they're asking is negative. Whether it's affirmative or negative, it really doesn't matter. We simply have to be able to give a definitive answer. Let's move on. 163. So this answer to this question is D, because both of these statements by themselves do the job quite nicely. I didn't mean to say both of these statements, I meant to say each of these statements by itself. 163. In 163 we are told that everyone contributes equally. Everyone contributes equally. We are also told we are also told that the total amount that we collected was sixty dollars. The question is how many people? How many people? I'm going to change this marker also. This marker is also dying. It is moribund. It was moribund because I just got rid of it. So we have something going on, some function is going on, or some charitable event is going on. I don't know what's going on. Every member of a certain club volunteers to contribute equally to the purchase of $60 gift certificate. Alright, so they're buying a gift certificate for somebody and every member of that club has agreed to contribute equally for the purchase of the $60 gift certificate. The question simply is how many people are there? Well, so the first, the f this is our first equation. This part, the fact that everyone contributes equally, that's our first equation. If everyone contributes equally, and if we have n number of people and each of them gives d dollars, then n times d has to be sixty dollars. d is the amount that uh, that each person gives, that each gives. Well, it's very straightforward. If we know if we know the number of uh, if we know uh, how many people is what they're asking here, we need to find out the n. If we can figure out how many people, how much uh, how much amount each person gave, we are home free. Let's see what they tell us. In the first statement, they tell us that everybody contributes. Oh, what do you know? Everybody, everyone gave four dollars each. This is too silly. If everyone gave four dollars each, there are fifteen people, obviously, because fifteen times four is sixteen. This is too damn silly. Way too silly. And you can pretty much count on the fact. You can pretty much count on the fact without even looking at what is given in the second statement that if this is too damn silly, if this was too easy, then the second statement is going to be anything but too silly. Second statement is going to be complicated, far complicated. Anyway, the first statement does the job quite nicely because we know everybody gave four dollars, we collected sixty dollars. If we collect a total of sixty dollars from n people, then n has to be fifteen because fifteen times four is sixty. A, D, B, C, E. A, D, B, C, E. Now that we established the first statement by itself is enough, we know now, answer cannot be B, C, or E, it would have to be either A or D. Let's look at second statement. In the second statement, in the second statement they tell us that if, if five didn't, if five people did not give their part of the contribution, then all the others, then all others, and we do not know how many all others, because that's the whole point, we don't know how many people there are, all others would have to fork out two dollars more each. All the other people in the club would have to fork out two extra dollars because of the fact, on account of the fact that five people simply refused, uh, refused that this five people simply said, no, I'm not paying my share. I'm not, I'm not going to give the money to the gift certificate and they need $60 because of the fact that in $60 they have to make up this amount, the shortfall from these five people 
And as a result, everybody will have to fork out two more dollars. That's our second equation. Are you able to see that? This is our second equation. We are done. The work is done. The problem is done. We are finished. There is the first equation, n times this, 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 this equation, this everyone gives equal amount, that was this equation right here. Our first equation was n times d equals 60, and this is our second equation. There lies, let me put the cap back on so I can give you a little sermon here. And for those of you who are a little weak in it, uh, algebra, and this is something is up to you obviously, uh, obviously watching this video is also up to you, nobody is forcing you. If you are weak in algebra, go to my channel. Go to my channel and look for Algebra Word Problem. Just look for a playlist called Algebra Word Problem. There are 100 videos there. In the beginning, they are very simple. They are very straightforward. They're going to go very fast. You can even skip a few if you want to. But work through as many word problems as you can in those 100 uh, Algebra Word Problem uh, there in the, in the playlist. And you will sharpen your skill to set up, a, to set up a, an equation from an, a, a sentence. What I'm trying to make you understand is that that's what a sentence is. Algebra is a language. What I'm trying to make you understand is that this was a sermon, which is why I had to put the cap back up and back on. Algebra is a language. And just like any language, languages are made up of words, they are made up of sentences, they are made up of expressions. Just like that, the equivalent, the comparable concept for a sentence in algebra is an equation. So when we see a sentence written down in English language, or for that matter, any language, we can translate this sentence in the language of algebra, but that's what it is. This sentence is, is a sentence in, sentence in algebra. A sentence in algebra is an equation. That is an equation. That is our second equation. That was our first equation, which came from that sentence. We have two equations, two independent equations, two unknowns, the number of people and the amount of the money that they gave us. We have two independent, un, two, two independent equations, two unknown. Of course, we can solve for the two variables. It can be done. The second statement by itself is also sufficient. The answer to this problem is done. And if you are able to see that right away, that we have two independent equations and two unknown, you are done in five seconds. Ten seconds at the most. That's it. You read the sentence, you say to yourself, well, there, there is my second statement. There was the first statement. I'm done. But of course, for learning purposes, we're going to carry on. Not in the real exam, but here we're going to carry on. We're going to actually finish it just for learning purposes. But the most important part is, how do we convert this 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 English language sentence into the sentence of algebra. That's the important part. So here we go. If five people did not, if five people did not, well, which means instead of n, instead of n number of people, we have five less than that. If five people did not contribute, all the others, so how many we are left with? We are left with n minus five. If five people did not contribute, we are left with n minus five, because n is the number of people we have. If five people did not contribute, then the number of people who are contributing now, the number of people who are giving the contribution, is n minus five. I'm going to read it a little bit nicely. n minus five are the number of people who are actually contributing. And how much are they going to contribute? Well, they go on to tell us that they will have to fork out two dollars more than before. Well, what about the giving before? They had agreed to give, they had all agreed to give d dollars each. Amount that each person gives was d dollars, d for dollars. Instead of d dollars each person, they will have to give two dollars more, so it's going to be d plus two. And that amount has to equal 60. But we also know that 60 equals n times d. Let's carry on. Let's carry on. I need, I need to get rid of this thing so I can open it up a little bit. And now we're going to open our parentheses. So n times d is n d. n times two is two n. Negative five times d is negative five d. And negative 5 times 2 is negative 10. And that equals n times d. n times d appears here, n times d appears here, we can get rid of it. And what we end up here is, what we end up here is, 2 times n minus 5d equals 10. But we know what d is. d, from this equation right here, from the first equation, we know that n times d equals 6 for 60, therefore d equals 60 over n. d equals 60 over n. We're going to put it in here. d equals 60 over n from here. We're going to substitute right in here on the top. But none of this is necessary, you understand? So here we go. Fa 2 times n, 2 times n minus, minus 5d, minus 5d, which we know is this amount right here, 60 over n equals 10 equals 10 
Let's keep on going. Multiply the entire equation by n, and we end up with 2n squared minus 5 times 60 equals 10n. I, we see a 2 here, we see a 60 here which is divisible by 3, we see a 10 here which is divisible by 2. Let's divide the entire equation by 2. If you divide the entire equation by 2, we could, we could divide the entire equation by 2 and we end up with n squared minus 5 times 30. 5 times 30 or 30 times 5. How much is 30 times 5? It's 150 equals 5n equals 5n. I'm going to pick up speed now. I'm not going to explain. I'm not going to explain every single step because if I have to explain every single step, then of course you're you're not meant for it. I'm just going to pick up speed here. So n squared minus 5n equals 150. So take out n from here, and we get. Now listen. When we get to this stage, when we get to this stage, we have actually two choices. When we get to this stage, we actually have two choices. We can. We can continue this thing like a good schoolboy or good schoolgirl and set it up as a quadratic equation, in which case we'll get n squared minus 5n minus 5n minus 150 equals to 0. That's 1. Or we can take a shortcut and we say to ourselves that n times n minus 5 equals 150. n times n minus 5 equals 150. So you take out the n common, n times n minus 5 equals 150. Can you think of two numbers? Can you think of two numbers such that one is five less than the other and their product is 150? Of course it's very simple. The numbers are 15 times 15 times 10. 15 times 10. This is 15 times 10 is 150. 15 times 10 is 150. That tells us that n is 15 and this is 15 minus 5. There you go. n is equal to 15. n is equal to 15. There were 15 people to start out with. There were 15 people to start out with. Which of course is no surprise to us at all, which should not be surprised as I always point out to you, the first statement clearly told us that there must have been 15 people because the first statement told us that everybody contributed four dollars. Even though, listen very carefully, okay? The reason why I did not go this route is for a reason. Even though, strictly speaking, you're supposed to delete all your memory, everything that you saw in the first statement, you're supposed to pretend that it never existed, but you did see the bloody thing. You did see the first statement. First statement told us that the first statement told us that each person contributed four dollars. Well, if each person contributed four dollars, there must have been fifteen dollars. This right here, which is why when we get to this stage, we can instead of going this route, we go, we go this route. N times n minus five equals one hundred and fifty, and we can clearly see it's fifteen. Fifteen works. Fifteen times fifteen minus five, which is ten. Fifteen times ten is one hundred and fifty. But if you went this route, you're going to have to set it up as a quadratic equation. And I don't know if you want to go that way. But if you can do that, or if you want to do that, we can do that too. It's going to be n squared plus 15n minus 10n minus 150 equals 0. Because positive 15n and negative 10, negative 10n gives, oh, we need, we need negative, negative 5, not positive 5. So this has to be negative, and this has to be positive. And negative 15, negative 15, n times positive 10 n is going to give us negative 150 n squared. This is called factorization, of course. Look at these two terms and we find out n is common. n minus 15 we left with here. And we look at these two terms. We can take out the common factor of 10. And we left with n minus 15 equals 0. Now, now from this part, n minus 15 is the common factor here. Take out n minus 15. And we left with n plus 10 equals 0. And if the product of these two numbers is 0, then either this number is uh, this product, n minus 15 is equal to 0, or n plus 10 is equal to 0. If n minus 15 is equal to 0, or n plus 10 is equal to 0. And of course, n plus 10 is not going to be equal to 0, because you cannot, we cannot have negative 10 people. We are dealing with people. It has to be a positive number. And therefore, n equals positive 15. Which is what we, which is what we claimed here. Which is exactly what we claimed here. Well, listen, that was a lot of fun, but that was unnecessary. All of that was unnecessary. You just had to be able to see that we have two very simple linear equation. Two very simple linear equation is saying that we have two very simple linear equation is not enough. 
we always have to qualify our statement by saying that we have two independent equations. If I give you two equations here, x, mi x minus y equals, equals 3, and then I give you another equation, 2x minus 2y equals 6, well, we have two equations here, but these two equations are not independent. These two equations are not independent because second equation is simply two times the first equation. And this won't do the job. These two equations are not enough to figure out the value of x and y. We need to have two independent equations where one equation is not derived from the other. And we did have two independent equations here. We have two independent equations, two unknown. There is no reason why we cannot figure it out. Do you understand? Now, I used, I used the word just now here. I want to finish it up before, uh, I'm going to wrap it up before, we, before I forget it. I just said that I just said that you can't simply go around saying that as long as you have two equations, we can solve for the two unknowns. That's not enough. You must always qualify your statement. You must always qualify your statement by saying that as long as you have two independent equations. I would like you to learn the meaning of the word qualify as it is used in this context. This is something that we learned long time ago in our vocabulary lessons, qualify. And I won't go into it right now because I'm very anxious to close this video. Do you understand? Qualify is something that we learn on day number 27. What does it mean to qualify a statement? To qualify a statement. Not to qualify for a job, but what does it mean to qualify your statement? Just type in GMAT vocabulary words, day number 27, and learn the word. Did we ever learn the word moribund? I said that I want to I need to change my marker because the other marker was moribund. What does it mean to be moribund? Oh, we learned this thing on day number 71. Day 71. Again, same exact deal, GMAT vocabulary words, day 71. Watch that video and you will learn the word more of it. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.